All right, thank you uh, very much, everybody, uh, for coming and welcome to the 523rd meeting of Canterbury Regional Council. Uh, today, we'd like to welcome uh, Nelson Early and Philip Haythorn Waite, uh, who will be speaking at our public forum. Uh, the meeting will adjourn at 11.15 uh, for 15 minutes. After that, at 11.30, we'll have re uh, report backs from two zone chairs, William Tom Thomas and Ken Huey. And that was reporting their annual, annual uh, report to the council. Uh, the meeting's not being live streamed, but we're recording it and the recording will be available on the council's website. Um, now to start, I'd like to invite uh, councillor Craig Pauling to give a mehi whakatau. Because <laughs> Moi mai, moi mai, oki oki mai. Apti hono tātai hono, toko batni ki toko mate, apti hono tātai hono, toko ora, ta kānu i ora, kua tai mai nei, a tēnā koutou. A tēnā koutou, kei roro i te tūnui o tēnei whare o tātou. A koutou e noho nei, koutou e mā taki nei, a tēnā koutou. A tēnā koutou, ka hara mai, o tēnei hui, O tēnei kaunihira, ah, tēnei tēnei timi i te akoutou. Ah, ki nga manuhiri, ah, ki nga memo tāpore, ah, hara mai, ah, ki te, ki te, ah, o tono mai, wero mai, ah, Philip Nelson, ah, Ken, Phil, ah, tēnei timi i te akoutou, ah, tēnei mai hara mai. Ah, nga ringa raupā o tēnei kaunihira, a tēnei tīmi i kia o koutou, a kai kauni hera, a tēnā koutou, a nō reira, koutou mā, kia ora tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou. A hua atu rākau kia, Councillor McKenzie, te karakia. Kia ora. Nga mai tēnei rā, nei auna kua katoa, e whakaro pai ka whakatau, e hua pai ka tipu mai, e pānga mou te katoa, Tāmi ei, hui ei. Tāmi ei. Thank you, Councillor Pauling, and thank you, Councillor McKenzie. We're moving on to apologies now. So we have apologies today from three councillors, Councillor Claire Mackay, Councillor John Sunkel, and Councillor Megan Hamm. There are no other apologies. Conflicts of interest, conflicts of interest. Um, I haven't been advised that it's any different. Uh, there's been no changes in that regard. So we have a public forum, we hear deputations and we receive petitions. Today we have uh, two people who will be speaking at our public forum. Uh, the first person uh, will be uh, Philip Haythorn-Waite. So we'd invite you to the table, Philip, to talk about bus doors aligning with bus exchange doors. Thank you very much. I believe you've got some uh, slides and uh, Toshi. Good morning, Madam Chair and VCAN councillors. Thank you for having the time to hear me. Madam, the issue comes out of what happened on the 8th of April last week. I was coming into town on the number three bus and getting off at door 11. And the photographs that have been sent to you by me, which I took, if you could put them up, please, the first one, just shows the first one, please, just simply shows, um, no, that, that, uh, I, uh, that one there, shows you what I saw to start with. Even as I was coming off the bus, I said, hey, where am I going to get off correctly? And you can see that the bus door 
and the exchange door align exact, giving you that hole. Now, I had a reply from Stuart Gibbon telling me that the bus is not parked correctly. And he has shown in photograph four that area even more dangerous in actual fact the wet that one with that beautiful circle around it why it needs filling in because yesterday when i was in the exchange a wheelchair even with the bus correctly parked forward in its correct position was wanting to get onto the bus the driver got off to put the landing, the, the ramp down. And he stood on that side there and just about put his right foot in there and lost his balance as well. So it is not just the passenger, it is also driver safety. And this picture at door 11 in actual fact is at every door from 1 to 16. And what basically needs doing is that it needs widening by about 300 millimeters by about a 500 to a 750 long. So it creates the space for the driver to stand safely without worrying about the his issue with the wheelchair user and to guarantee the safety. Now, I understand what Stuart says, that if the bus is not parked forward, it may not in its, be not in its correct position and it may affect the back door. But on these two occasions, people with their walking frames, there was someone with their a walking stick yesterday, someone trying to get on with their wheelchair and the, the driver being affected, these holes need to be got rid of. They were there as part of the design of this exchange when it was built. And if you look carefully at the next photograph, I think that Stuart has there, or it may not be, no, you can't see it. There's a little concrete line further up that shows exactly where the door opens to it, marked in the concrete. But it needs to just go a bit further forward than that to just make it safe for the passenger and the driver serving the person with their disability. It's as simple as that. Could we please have the area extended slightly? It would not affect the bus going in and out because of where the bus is already pumped. Uh, but that is a safety issue for us in the disability community. And especially, you have to remember one other factor. With your new teal buses, the male loses their visual impact on the teal buses in the blue-green area, and so has more difficulty seeing those buses now than you realise. And that's something that's already been publicly commented on by um, the Blind Foundation in the papers earlier this year. So please, with this, it's a simple job between you and council. Can we please have all 16 doors sorted out on safety grounds? That really is it for me. Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, thank you, Philip. Has anybody got any questions um, about this matter? Councillor Farm. Just a comment if there's no questions. It's okay, Chair. Um, yeah, just such a straightforward issue. Thank you for raising it, Philip, because this is exactly the health and safety responsibility that we want to take on board. So, yeah, just thank you for raising it today. It, it does seem very clear cut, and we'll get advice from staff about um, what implications, if any, there are, but it seems pretty straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Clearwater. Well, just a comment, really, and thank, thank you, Philip, for, for raising this very straightforward and important issue. And I'm just really making a comment to um, our staff, perhaps into the chair, that 
I'm assuming that that we obviously would have discussions with City as John, uh, sorry, as Philip indicated, um, particularly because uh, they have City have the ownership of the, of the building. But I don't, I don't. I just might get a comment from our CEO uh, first, Philip. Hold on. I'm certainly happy to investigate, which is what I expect you yeah. will ask of me, Council, and we will certainly come back by virtue of that. And any conversation that would be needed with City would happen in that context. Madam, it needs to be remembered that this is one of the problems that you have. You are responsible for the timetables and contracts. The Council is responsible for the buildings, the bus stops, everything like that outside that you use. And just by way of comment on safety issues, you need to also breathe down the neck of the council about some of the bus stops where they, they are in the cycle lanes. Ironically, the most dangerous bus stop in the city is by St. John's Ambulance on bus on St. Asaph Street, because there's no warning signs on either side of the bus stop to say that the bus stop crosses the cycle lane to get to the edge of the curb where the passenger loads. And it's been very fortunate that people like myself, first aid qualifications, haven't had to get off the bus to attend to your passengers wanting to get on. Thank you, Philip. Well, thank you. Um, so I don't think there's any further questions, um, but I want to thank you very much. You're doing your citizens' role in our democracy by coming along and telling us. And there's no doubt we have very good uh, collaboration between our staff and CCC staff and us as elected members. So it's uh, just can assure you that we're on to it. And um, thank you very much for alerting that to us. It looks quite a quite a potentially dangerous situation to me. So thank you very, very much. So now um, if the uh, at the next meeting. We usually try to do that by the next meeting, but I'll work with the staff. If it's not done by the next meeting, you'll still have an update about where we're at. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for taking your time to come in. It's excellent. Um, so now we're going to have a resolution uh, and I'll call for a mover and a seconder that the council receives the information from Philip Haythorne Waite and refers the matter raised to the CEO to reply. Who would like to move that? Moved by Councillor Grant Edge and seconded by Councillor Phil Clearwater. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, anyone against? There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much, Philip. We'll be in touch. Bye. Ah, now I'd like to invite um, Nelson Early to come to the table and uh, talk to us about uh, water allocation uh, from his farming practice. Thank you very much for coming in, Nelson. Over to you. Uh, Madam Chair and Councillors, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come up today to speak about water allocation and nutrient um, allocation as well. I want to be talking about what the problems are with allocation and the consenting issues there are, and maybe what could be done to make it a, a little bit more effective than what it is now. But before I start doing that, I've got a question I'd like to, to leave you to all ponder on. What kind of farming systems do you want to support here in, on the Canterbury Plains? High impact farming or very low impact farming? Because that's what the issue is I'm going to be talking about and um, hopefully I'll explain that a little bit more. So I've got some note form here so I can go through things and if you've got some questions at the end, please please ask me. First of all, I want to talk about what the kind of farming I'm doing, what I do, why I do it and how I do it. I'm far a cropping farmer up in Greendale and I've been there all my life along with previous generations and um, all I do is crop with a range of crops. We're growing linseed, lentils, peas, wheat, barley, clovers, and uh, we do that on a rotation year to year. We're on temperate and silt loam, so we're on very good cropping soils. And we select our crops on two, 
two parameters, one on how much water they use and the other one on how much nutrient they require. So we're farming for around the water and the nutrient. And currently we're planting all of our, as many of our crops in the autumn, and that way it means we use a whole lot less water because through the winter we're getting the rains and in the spring the plant's already up and growing, so it requires less water and nutrient through into that spring summer period. Over the last nine years, we've been we've been watering for ten years. I couldn't find the, the, the first year of what our, what water we use, but for the last nine years, we've averaged a hundred mils of water across the farm per hectare. So that for those, uh, it's about that much water over the farm. In comparison, for other farming systems in the area and some of my neighbours, they're using three times that amount of water. And in comparison, I believe here in the Christchurch city, they're using up to about double that per hectare. So we're using absolute minimum amount of water to produce um, the crops we, we grow. Uh, we, we irrigate at a rate of three point mills per hectare per day. That's across the whole farm. And on a, on a hot Northwest day, you'll get a trans evaporation rate of six. So we don't really have enough water but we're trying to do as much as with the water we've got to make the best outcomes we can. We're farming on a nutrient loss less than 15, and this current season we've just gone through, only about a quarter of our farm has uh, had any nitrogen put on it. So we're trying to get away from using any nitrogen fertilisers, and we're trying to push that end loss figure as low as we possibly can. We don't do any winter grazing, and uh, we haven't been doing any winter grazing for many, many years now. That's why our figures has got so low. Just to give you a, 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 some perspective of what water does in my operation, in a dry year, water will double the yield in cereals. So if you've got a paddock of wheat producing, say, six tonne in a really dry year, which can happen uh, with 100 mils or maybe a little bit more than 100 mils, you can double that yield. And in small seeds like some clover, you can increase that yield by about 400%. So it is massive amounts of difference on yield with a little bit of water. Not only does um, the water increase the yield, it actually helps the environment and the uptake of nutrients. So when you're putting on fertilisers, if you've uh, got the plants growing with and the plants are looking really healthy, they'll uptake all the nitrogen. And that's why we have a rotation of crops so we can uptake the nitrogen, so we can um, utilise it. But the water helps uptake that uh, nutrient. So it's really important. Also, the uh, importance of water is uh, it actually reduces the fire risk. Um, for, for those that have lived in Canterbury for many years, um, used to be mid, big massive fires across the Canterbury Plains because there was no irrigated areas. And I remember spending many time putting them out. The problem with our current consenting system it is designed around first and first served, which does not help the environment. People with the most money or the people who are in first have got the greater allocations of water and it hasn't served our environment very well. I was lucky enough to be brought up between the Selwyn River and the Holrada River, and as a child I'd swim in the Holrada River every day during summer. You used to be able to drink that water. Now you can't swim in it, and you can't drink it. And I think that's just absolutely appalling. It's something we need to be doing something about. So I, um, our consent is currently up for renewal, and ours is an adaptive management consent. And the proposed changes to our consent uh, do not give good environmental outcomes. Currently, our well, our consent is uh, measured by our well level. So if the well level is um, really low, we will not have any water for the season. Now, that has not happened for the 10 years of the duration of our consent. But the new proposed changes are that that uh, monitor bore will not be our own well, it'll be some bore that is way different from our farm, different location, 
and it may mean that our water gets turned off. And that might sound, well, that's great, there's going to be more water for the aquifers and that, but what it does is means that I will not know if my well is going to be turned off by about mid-September. By that stage, all my fertiliser has gone onto the farm, onto the paddocks that are going to be fertilised, which is mainly the cereals. That nutrient won't get taken up because there'll be no water there to uh, in a dry year to take it up, so that nutrient has a real risk of running through into our aquifers and, and that's what we don't want. Currently where our house is and it's been there for over 100 years, we cannot use the groundwater there to drink uh, at our original level which is 30 metres because it's been polluted with nitrates and um, that's advised not that we don't drink it. And I'd love to be able to use my house well again so we had to put an irrigation well and we're pumping it at over 100 metres now and that's our drinking water. So what I'm proposing today, well, actually, before I get to that, we've got to, we've got three options, and none of them are very good options for the environment. We've got options of joining CPW. CPW have got um, plenty of spare water in their system, and I've talked to them a few weeks ago at the Machinery Field Days and said, we'd love to supply you with water. And not only can you have more water than what you've got now, you can um, have a whole lot more allocation for nutrient loss. And I can't see how that's going to help the environment. So I don't want to go down that path because I don't see it being beneficial to the environment. Um, the other one is that we can buy an expensive consent of somebody that has um, been given their consent uh, many years ago. And if I want to do that and retain what I've, the water I've got now, I'd be up to between uh, 250 to $400,000, which is really not feasible. And the other option is that we sell the farm and move somewhere else and let somebody convert our farm. In the last 20 years, Canterbury has changed from predominantly sheep and crop to dairy, and it's been driven by dollar return per hectare. Currently, most dairy farmers were doing three times per hectare than what we are, and that's why the conversion's been happening, because it's been beneficial on the financial side. So a farm like mine would be easily converted and that would be likely to happen because it's not viable the way it is at the moment if we have to go to a consent that may we may be turned off. So my proposal is that we um, the council look at changing these consents, particularly the adaptive management and trying to promote good farming in Canterbury. And maybe if this is an article I saw in the newspaper the other day about the mega system of over at Mayfield, and this was not a really good news um, article. It doesn't reflect very good on um, anybody in there, particularly the people don't like what ECAM are doing. And and the, it says here that they've got an opportunity to use 104 units of nitrogen, uh, and that's a huge amount. It's only going to pollute our waterways. I don't believe that's the kind of farming we need in Canterbury here at all. We want low impact farming. And I would like to see ECAN here support low, low impact farming, which is what I'm doing, and give us an opportunity to have a more secure consent. CPW has taken a huge amount of um, land area up in, in the area I am, and many of those consents have now lapsed or been taken away from those people. and I would like to ask that the council consider trading my consent and, and deleting my consent and giving an opportunity to take on one of those consents that give reliable water. And I'm not asking for any more water. I'd consider taking less water and keeping my nutrient losses low like they are, because I don't intend to change my farming practice. And I'd like you to consider supporting good farming on Canterbury Plains. I don't know if I've got any more to say. Um, other than that, it would be great to see, instead of this kind of article and the and the pages of the press, that maybe ECAN supporting uh, and getting the support of Cantabrians supporting good farming in Canterbury. Thank you very much, Nelson. Um, 
have we got anybody that would like to ask some questions? Uh, we've got um, Councillor Nicole Marshall and then um, a couple of people on the side. You go first, Nicole. Got a, um, it was just a question of clarification. Um, you've, propo uh, you've, you've stated that under the proposed new consent, you wouldn't know if you had water until after you'd applied your fertiliser. But my understanding of the adaptive management system is the water levels either side of the changes were both from 1st of September. So I'm confused how that has changed. Excellent. Good, great question there. Look, we will we get informed when our, if we can use our water on, well, it's meant to be the 1st of September, but the time we actually get told, yes, you're up and going is about mid-September. By then, the cereals need fertiliser on August and September. So by then, the fertiliser is already on. So if they say to me, oh, sorry, you've got no water, I can't pick that fertiliser back up and say, oh, we won't put it on there. That's already on the property. So you need the water to make that fertiliser be uptaken into the plant. So does that ask, answer your question? No. So I could, yeah. Sorry, could I just interrupt, Chair? Um, just a little bit of guidance. We, we can't talk about the specifics of the consent, partly because it's live. So if there are questions of clarification, they should be kind of at that higher level. Otherwise, um, we've got some issues. So just keep them up there, please. For all that one that you just said then, and we can we can have some discussions, staff can have some discussions with you about that as we go along. Councillor Lan Farm. Yeah, sorry, I'm just thinking about my question if it's too detailed. Okay, thank you. So, um, Vicky Southworth. Yeah, and thank you very much for your presentation. It's really interesting to hear from someone out in the rural environment who's giving a different perspective from the ones that we do read in the papers. Um, I'm just wondering how many more farmers are there who are in the similar boat to you? Are you in contact with others and, and do you? Is this an issue for many, or or are you fairly unique? Great question. No, there is there is a few in my boat. There's getting less and less because people. If you look at the cropping side of what's happening in Canterbury, there's getting less and less. They've been taken over by dairy farms, and beautiful soils are put under under dairy farms. So there is less. There are people out there in the same boat, but the, that number is getting smaller and smaller. Some people have joined CPW and they do winter grazing there. So if I joined in and did anything like what they don't, I'd have to do winter grazing too. But there is less. It's not just me. There is other people, but not huge amounts. Thank you. Um, our councillor um, Claire Wooden, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Nelson. I just wondered, um, uh, with climate change and somewhat already warmer temperatures, if you had sufficient water, I'm just wondering, um, would there be any new crops that you could um, consider planting that would um, you know, make your farm productive? We are constantly looking at it all the time, and I'm always open to suggestions on that. But no, we have we have changed. Like linseed, this was a new crop to us this year, and it, it, it's very low. Um, input on you don't put any fertilizer on it and minimal water so we're actually doubling the area of that so we're we're trying to farm around the environment and we always have been and that's one of my key things farm what's suited for the environment and that's what it's worked well for us in the past but look some years you get a super dry year some years like uh, two years ago we used a week's worth of water that's all because it was a wet year so we didn't bother turning our irrigators on so we try and farm for what we've got but thank you for your question Thank you. Um, Councillor Grant Edge. Just two two quick questions. The the date of the article that you showed us, what, what date was that? It was the 8th of April, Thursday, the 8th of April, 2021. Secondly, just a comment. Um, I think your system, um, low impact farming, um, we're in a it's a climate change situation, so low low water usage and all those other things are really, really important to see. Um, where, where do you think you're going to need to go next? Are you needing to have more conversations about the adaptive um, management 
consenting process that council has in place at the moment? Are, are you wanting further discussion about about the implications of it? Currently, we're working through a consultant, and they are suggesting we uh, buy somebody's water, which I'm very hesitant about. Uh, if we buy water, particularly if we're spending anywhere up to four hundred thousand dollars, it means it changes farming system, which is going to be negative on the uh, on the environment. And I'm hoping we can carry on discussing and and see some change. And that change might not happen just for me, hopefully for other people. I want to see change for the better for the environment. That is my key thing, and I'm hoping it's going to work for, well, for me and others too. But hopefully discussions carry on we, and we do get an outcome. Have you got a question, uh, Councillor uh, McKenzie? Yeah, th th thank you, uh, Chair, Madam Chair. Um, Nelson, uh, th thanks for your presentation. And um, uh, there are quite a, quite a few people uh, in the Ashburn community who have uh, ad problems with their adaptive management as well. I, I guess my question is, uh, um, do, you, 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 do you understand that uh, under the terms of the central fresh water package, actually your, your farm can't be transferred to dairy, can't transfer to dairy farming or to winter grazing? Yes, look, I am aware there is some changes there and there are, if, depending on who you're talking to, obviously um, people here in council understand those changes because they've been written up there. There are ways and means of doing some changes, not not extensive change, but there are some changes. I believe. You'll be able to best inform me on those changes. Not, not, not unfortunately for you to transfer to dairy or uh, winter grazing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pauling. Kia ora, uh, tēnā Nelson. Thanks so much for um, bringing this to our attention. And um, thanks also for explaining your um, the way you do things on your farm. Um, I learned a lot, so thanks for that. Um, and I agree that the first in, first served approach is, doesn't serve anyone well, and I think that's been debated at a national level for, for some years. Um, obviously, that's where it sits, unfortunately, for us. And, at national level until that changes. It's, it's hard for us to do something about that, but I do think it's worthy of discussion and further discussion with the government. Um, and just to touch on, yeah, can't do nothing at the moment in terms of the uh, consent process, but it does seem to me that this falls out of planning processes as well. And um, I think that we have a new round of plans coming towards us, partly because of the um, piece of regulation that Ian mentioned in terms of MPS for fresh water. Um, so it would be my hope that this is something we uh, ask our staff to have a look at and see how we can, um, you know, you've sort of said about encouraging low impact farming or whatever it is and how our plans into the future can do that. That's That would be my hope. Um, so I'm just letting you know that, that that's hopefully what we could do in the next round of planning because that's what's coming for us all. So yeah. I can't say that that's going to happen, but that would be my hope that we look at that and our staff can help provide us advice and, of course, interact with yourself and other people in your position uh, to see if we can do that. So that, I think it sounds like that would be a, a good way to go. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Did you want to make a response to that? No, not necessarily. No. Um, uh, you've met Couch Lewis. Um, kia ora and uh, thank you also for um, explaining um, the, um, I've got this word type and I've underlined it with the, the way you farm. I just for clarification, are you saying that there is a mismatch between the type or the manner in which you farm between the way you operate your farm under those headings and the regulatory process that is on offer at the moment. Is that what you're saying to us? I'm not quite sure what you're uh, questioning there, but the, 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 the farming I'm doing is, is around using minimal water 
but the, the consent going forward, up to date it's been reliable, but going forward there's no certainty that it will be reliable anymore. So it puts into question what I'm doing, going to do going forward, but not only that, it, it does uh, potentially will have some great negative impacts on the environment, and that's what I want to not have happen, and I want some re reliability around certainty going forward. So it's not mismatch, it's more around reliability, because what I'm hearing you say is that at the moment you have an adaptive management consent, and what you and the other emphasis you're putting on this. Excuse me, um, Yvette, I'm sorry, but I've been advised by the CE oh. that we sh we sh yeah, we shouldn't um, go too into too much detail. But once again, that's something we, you can discuss with staff. So that'd be good. Um, have I got any other questions from anybody? Um, no, but I want to um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if all the councils recall, but on about the 19th of December in our first term, just before Christmas, um, uh, four of us went to visit Nelson at his farm. There was myself, Tane, Ian, and um, Councillor John Suncle. And it was really fantastic because what you said today is what we saw in action. So I want to thank you very much uh, for coming in. In the meantime, um, there, there has been some interactions uh, with, with staff. So we will be um, asking um, the CEO to investigate this and have a look into all the things you raised. And um, I'm sure there's a number of us around the table that um, would support the comments made by uh, Councillor Pauling around um, uh, putting um, uh, sustainable farming practices for the environment that you're, you're, you're currently operating under at the foremost of our, our way forward. And um, you can be rest assured that we are working here across the whole of the the organisation, the elected members and the staff uh, to improve the situation with water across Canterbury. So thank you for um, coming forward and explaining your situation and how you farm. I think that was really a very good illustration of what's going on. So we'll just finish it there and uh, we'll move a resolution now. So if you'd like to just um, leave the table, that'd be great. And um, we, I'll call for a mover and a seconder for a resolution. Just to clarify, make sure that it's, it's, it's the planning process for the consent. Okay. Uh, that the council uh, receives the information from Nelson Early and refers the matters raised to the chief executive to reply. Moved by Councillor Ian um, McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Lan Farn. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you so much uh, for for um, for that explanation, Nelson, and for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, and you'll be hearing back from us in about um, as soon as we can. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much. much. Thank you. Right. Um, on with the council business. Uh, we'll we'll if you go to page ten to twenty, you'll find the minute. Um, how are we going to deal with this? I'll ask the council secretary to talk about the minutes for a minute. Councillors, um, the, the rather long um, item 8.2 of the minutes where, where the council made some changes to their submission on the Climate Change Commission advice. Um, as was pointed out to me earlier, um, I, in the minutes on the agenda, I had all the changes, but actually at the meeting, we it was a staged um, decision. So um, I've emailed you all a copy of the corrected. I have some hard copies here, but just to um, for the record, um, the first change to paragraph three was moved by the chair and seconded by Councillor Clearwater. The second change uh, to um, amending paragraph eight was moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Southworth. Then the amending paragraph uh, the 27 um, was moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Apanui. And then the one on the heat industry and power, which was paragraph 33, you're still with me, <laughs> um, was Councillor Southworth and seconded by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. And then we had a wrap up. Um, resolution which is correct on the minutes on page 16 um, 
are moved by Councillor Farr, but seconded by Councillor Pauling, that the submission as amended be submitted to the Climate Change Commission and delegates to the Chief Executive and the Chair to finalise and approve the, the final submission. So the five minutes will repeat. Thank you very much, and um, I can verify that um, that's now correct. So thank you very much to the Council Secretary. I don't think there was any other issues with the minutes, so thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Um, we're going to move a resolution now. The Council receives and confirms the, uh, the, minute, the correct record of the minutes as amended of the meeting on the 11th of March 2021, moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by... Councillor Tane Upanui. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much. Public excluded minutes. Um, we've looked at public excluded minutes on page 21. Uh, did anybody have any questions about those? I don't think so. So I'll call for somebody to move that we receive and confirmed as the correct record the minutes of the part of the meeting held with the public excluded on the 11th of March. To, um, 2021. Who would like to move that? Moved by Councillor Grant Edge, seconded by Councillor um, Scott. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against that, carried. Thank you very much. Uh, matters arising. Uh, Count, uh, I'll just ask the executive, the chief executive, to report on any replies we've had to people who have come to our forum. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou and thank you, Chair. Um, there were th three public fora upon which we commented and responded. In the first instance, to Mr. Michael Pratchett, uh, to the Wildlife Trust. Uh, this was regarding the Otakaino catchments, and we encouraged him to uh, submit into the LTP. Uh, and I understand that has occurred, so you will be hearing those uh, in the next weeks. Uh, the second set was Davina Penny and Ms. Anne Marie Youngman with regard to the quarries, and we provided a, a set of uh, letters to both with some details around the responses. I can also confirm that there's further work ongoing in that space, and we'll be working with you as council and the communities. And then thirdly, Mr. Graham Townsend on climate change, who we thanked and acknowledged for his excellent presentation to you as council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, our CEO. Is there any comment about those? Are we fine? Now, what, what we're going to do now is we're going to take our adjournment um, now at 11.15 uh, for morning tea, and we'll, we'll be adjourned for 15 minutes, um, and then we'll come back and get on with the rest of the reports. So, yeah, we'll go to the Zone Committee reports immediately after, um, after morning tea. So we're... We're, we're, we're moving to adjourn. Thank you very much. So the council is now again in session at 1.10. We're going to page 23, committee report 7.1, um, and our councillor Edge. Thank you, Chair. I'll just... Um... Uh, this report is on the performance audit and risk committees meeting that was held on the 25th of March. Um, some recommendations here, one through four. I'd like uh, to move that these be uh, accepted by council. Do I have a seconder? Oh, I probably am supposed to do that part. If you just want to speak to it, are you going to? Oh, all right, let's move them first then. So it's moved by uh, Councillor Grant Edge, seconded by Councillor Vicky Southworth. Um, and now, are there, are there, would you like to speak to it? Yeah, yeah, so I could speak to a couple of things, especially item three, which some councillors uh, who obviously weren't at the um, risk committee meeting. The National Wells um, Database Project is a um, database solutions and it's aimed at providing some standardization um, of collecting well and bore information across New Zealand and um, Environment Canterbury was the instigator of that project and it's um, has contributed financially through contributing uh, other resources as well. Um, this is a, a couple of other things. The database is going to allow for reporting at the national level. It's going to be a simpler process. 
there are 10 regional councils across New Zealand that will eventually um, collaborate on the project. And um, in terms of the four startup councils, it's Environment Canterbury, Waikato, Otago and Auckland Regional Council, and they've made a form, uh, firm commitment already. Um, the, the issue before us is that there is um, Environment Canterbury um, has offered to act as a, a banker, if you like, to get the start the, the project underway without delay. Um, and effectively giving a three year loan to the other council participants. So that's that's um, um, and re repayments, I understand, will take place about July um, 2021, and then they should all be completed um, after that date. Are there any other? Oh, are there any other questions about this report? We'll, we'll get this sorted out when we go into the new structure. Um, about how this works. Um, any questions on that report? Yes. Um, kia ora. I just wanted to talk about what Grant said about the new Wales database solution. Replacing this has been a 10 year journey, pretty much, to get to this point. Um, and there's been huge action across our staff and between staff across councils. And I really want to thank everyone who's been involved in getting us to today. I also want to note on page 31. Okay of the agenda, um, the comments around the changes to the Holiday Act for provision of leave for miscarriages. I asked this question the day after the day of the third reading of that bill and it had passed and staff already had processes underway to establish that. Um, and being able to give that reassurance to us within 24 hours is huge. It shows, a, it really clearly demonstrates mana akitanga in action, looking after our people and the mayatanga getting it done. And I want to, thank our team for just displaying our values so well through being that well organized Any other comments? all right well i'll put that resolution all those in favor please say aye there being nobody against that carry thank you very much councillor edge um 7.1.2 on page 35 of the agenda the regulation and hearing committee um, would you like to introduce that or Lan or speak to it? Yeah, thank you, Chair. This is just receiving the unconfirmed minutes from our meeting of the 18th of March, and there was just one main item on that, which was an objection of costs incurred in the processing of a resource consent application. And so we appointed a commissioner to hear that. Um, unless there's any questions, which looking around the room, it doesn't appear to be, I will um, move these and Look for a seconder, thank you. Okay, who would like to second that? Seconded by Councillor Edge. I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Anybody against? No. That being uh, the, net, the situation, I'll declare that carried. Thank you very much. We're moving on. Um, well, we've already done item eight. Now we're going to skip, skip ahead. Page 47. Page 47. Page 47, uh, Councillor Southworth and Councillor McKenzie, would you like to speak to this item? So this is carrying on uh, um, describing the things that we're doing in terms of responding to the climate emergency. And uh, this month we've got quite a few things that have occurred. Um, and so I'll just cover off a few of those things and then Liz will talk about, Councillor McKenzie will talk about uh, our youth welfare and virus schools. Um, so we've had, um, last September, we had an Enviro, an Enviro School Climate Change Hui, which was attended by teachers from across the region, and they helped develop the educational resources for uh, teachers to um, share more knowledge and, and, and inform children about climate change. Um, at this particular week, we've also then just heard that Christchurch is going to be the first city in New Zealand to have a climate action campus, which is hugely exciting. And it's going to be a campus that in the first instance will be able to have up to or have 8000 students potentially participating in learning about climate change and then putting their learning to action. And that was one of the things that really strongly came out of the climate change hui was about climate anxiety and the need to do something when you feel anxious and that um, climate action campus will give that opportunity. We then last week saw the uh, school strike for climate, um, our own council of farm was invited to speak at that amongst other speakers. It was attended by 2000 young people 
um, and they were clearly very passionate about needing to again do something about climate change um, and in particular there are two things that Environment Canterbury has influence over and that's in terms of the, the key local demands that the, the young strikers were asking for was uh, better public transport access to public transport and also climate change education and those are two things that were embedded within our consultation that's just recently closed and that we will be considering in our deliberations on our long, on our long term plan and the and budget. Uh, and then um, finally, just to note that we are incredibly fortunate to have an international wetlands conference coming to Christchurch this year, it was postponed from last year. Um, it's a huge privilege to have that. We'll have experts on wetlands from around the world coming uh, virtually, I think, for the most part this time. Um, but also those experts in, in, in New Zealand able to come and hopefully Australia. And uh, the youth engagement team that we'll have, which uh, Councillor Mackenzie will speak about, uh, have were involved in, some, in World Wetlands Day last year, and they will be also bringing something to the Wetlands Conference. So we've got lots of exciting things being linked with that to Councillor Mackenzie. So yeah, in addition to the um, climate change events, um, we've got at Environment Canterbury a youth engagement team and um, they run an Enviro Schools program for the younger kids and also the youth ROPU for um, the older uh, young, young adults. Um, so the Enviro Schools program supports our school children to plan, design and implement sustainability actions at school and in the community. Um, the program, program reaches over 21,000 school children throughout Canterbury and the Chatham Islands. Um, and it includes a significant component of climate change related content. Um, in terms of the Environment Canterbury Youth Rōpū, um, which is like the Youth Council, um, this gives young people aged 14 to 24 um, an opportunity to get involved and to learn about the Regional Council. Climate change is an issue that is of high importance to the Youth um, Rōpū and they've had workshops um, with the staff here to develop a submission on climate change um, on Environment Canterbury's long-term plan. They have also been involved in nationwide climate change organisations um, like the Aotearoa Climate Emergency Panel. Um, so yeah, climate change will have a massive impact on our young people. So I think um, it's really important that their voices are heard at our council. Thank you both very much. Were there any questions? Councillor Ian. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. At the bottom of page 47, you say that the virus schools is coordinated by ECAN in partnership with those district councils and city councils. Um, I understood that the TAs are no longer putting in any funding. So what's the nature of the partnership? Um, can I just ask the staff to clarify that? I haven't got the director of comms and engagement here, but I think it, the short answer is it varies and has varied over time. Catherine, can I ask you? The district councils, especially Waimaku and Selwyn, still put in money. It's the city that's, that's um, I think, it's the one that's in question. The city's getting fixed this time around, I understand. Um, they took greater uh, here, so I think that's fixed. But we can get you more details about that if you like, um, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Lan Farm. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just on that, I think the difference in terms of funding is broadly around whether it's ongoing funding as part of the LTP or grant funds, which are much more difficult to actually plan for and provide certainty to schools going forward. So, that and that was the situation with the City Council. Yeah, Councillor Southworth. That my understanding is what is also for a new council have not been committed to funding this for a little while, but we've been part of that on the name. Just point out that this is a public meeting, so staff will get the information from behind the scenes, so everybody's on the same page. I think that would be a better idea. Councillor Clearwater. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to um, comment on the World Wetlands Conference, which sounds really great, and just I'm assuming that um, staff will let us know details of that and how as many as possible may be able to attend that kind of thing. Um, it's clearly quite a, a crucial um, part of climate change. I believe the CE would like to speak about that. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Clearwater, and I'll ask Dr Tim Davey to comment. He's on the actual organising 
committee and he was also responsible for being part of um, selecting abstracts and other parts of the conference. Can I hand over to you, Tim? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, the conference, I, the dates from the top of my head are October the 5th to whatever that week is of October the 5th. Uh, we certainly will provide details around it. There'll be a lot of um, There'll be a lot of publicity about it. The, one of the great stories about this is that we're going to be in Tapai. We're actually going to be the first conference in Tapai. Um, and what's even better is we're getting Tapai for free, which is uh, because they're they're wanting to um, promote Tapai. And at the moment, uh, I think off the top of my head, it was about uh, twelve hundred abstracts have come in, or you know, it's a it's a big number. We're going to have a lot of people probably remotely from overseas by October, but certainly um, Australians are excited to come and we've got a lot of Australians who are likely to be coming and it will be a big conference. But very happy to provide more details when they come in. This came up at um, our, our, our meeting, um, Council Pauling, with um, the lake, didn't it? So I think there's going to be some local projects um, presented I just thought you might be involved in it. Yeah, I think the Hauriri wetlands is going to be um, have one of the presentations. So, yeah, and there may be others. So well worth attending. Um, Councillor McKenzie. And I think there is some discussion with uh, the ECAN Land Care Trust project wetlands as assets to be involved in presenting examples. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, have we got a resolution to receive this that receives the update on? Did you want to say any more about that conference? No. It receives an update on the climate change work program. So we'll take that as moved by Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie and seconded by Councillor uh, Vicky Th Southworth. All those in favour, please say aye. Anyone against? No. So that's carried. I have to say that item's getting more and more interest interesting. So congratulations to whoever's helping with that. You're doing a great job. It's fantastic. I think that's congratulations to everyone because it went across a few areas. All right, so we're on page um, 49 and it's the Canterbury Water Management Strategy Regional Committee report and Councillor Paul is going to lead that for us. Jenny. Um, hi, kia ora koutou. Um, yep, uh, pleased to uh, lead the discussion on this. Um, just firstly, just want to start off by acknowledging the significant work that's gone in um, to the the, um, the refresh of the CWMS Regional Committee. I think we started like May or something last year, 2020, um, and worked through. And we that involved discussions, many numerous discussions here at Council, uh, but also with the current Regional Committee, which is an important step. And that, of course, includes our Te Rurunga or Naitahu and Hapa Tupu Rurunga representatives on that committee. Um, a number of factors uh, were a catalyst for looking at the refresh. So just giving people a bit of background. Um, that included key changes to um, since the committee and the CDOMS were established in 2010. Um, one of them being a democratic council, um, more of us, more connected to our communities. Um, the zone committees having grown in strength and confidence and also reporting directly to council uh, rather than via the regional committee. Um, and also, I suppose, a desire to have a smaller, more nimble and independent um, committee to advise council on key strategic matters as well as monitoring the progress of the achievement of the CWMS. Um, in December 2020, last year, um, the Council agreed to the refresh um, and set out the terms for that. Um, and this piece of paper is a follow up in relation to implementing the changes that we agreed to in December. In particular, it looks at the terms of reference for the committee, uh, it looks at a role description for the committee chair slash co chairs, um, one appointed by Environment Canterbury and one appointed by Thurman or Naitahu. Um, a process for appointing the ECAN co-chair, a letter of shared priorities, including Naitahu, Waturunanga or Naitahu and Papatapurunanga input, and the next steps. Um, I'm pleased that we've reached this significant point um, after the work that's been put in. Um, and it does demonstrate a, a high level of teamwork and engagement, uh, and as well as a bit of innovation and openness. And I think that's particularly in relation to providing or co-chairs in conjunction with NITO, which is something that came up recently. Um, so I think that's important to acknowledge. 
And to this end, and due to um, ongoing engagement with NITO on that matter, uh, there have been some changes to the original recommendations that went out to the public in the papers. So because of that, and um, because of the interdependent nature of the different decisions, uh, we're going to bring these up on screen, as you can see here, and um, go through these and explain them, and then open them up for discussion before voting, and then if everyone's happy with that. So that's good, Council Pauling. We'll just ask Toshi to bring them up and have a look. Do you want to um, go through them, seeing you worked on it? Yeah. So the first one is the ground. In terms of reference for the overall um, CWMS committee, now you will note that that has the new purpose in there that lines up with the zone committee. Um, new refresh in terms of reference as well. Um, as well as the major function of the regional committee, uh, the makeup of the committee, etc. So I'm happy to move that and uh, open it up for discussion or ask for a second. Okay, who would like to second that? Second by Councillor Farm. Um, um, questions? Anybody got any questions or right discussion? Craig, do you want to lead off with any discussion? Happy. Everyone happy? All right, we'll put that to the vote. Are we going to move that separately? Yeah, we'll move that. Well, so I'll just move that. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, anybody against? There being no one, that's carried. Thank you, Craig. Second second one, so go back to the other page, sorry. There's another one on there. Um, so the second one is about the role description for the chair slash co-chair. Now, I say that because this is part of that um, thing I raised before about the ongoing engagement with NITA on this. At the time of writing, we didn't know uh, whether Naitahu was in agreement to accept the co-chair position. We've since uh, had that confirmation from Peruna or Naitahu. Um, so now we can say that that's definitely going to happen or if we agree with that. So the role description would be for the chair slash co-chair, so both. Um, and that would obviously be played out through implementation. So um, again, I'd move that, the role description be approved. And who can second that? Would you like to, who would like to see that counts? Uh, Vicky Southworth. All those in favour, please say aye. Being no and against, that's carried. Thanks, Craig. One. Um, so the third one is about the uh, independent chair and um, the process for selecting an independent chair. Now we have a few options in the paper. Um, really, the main difference was about the advertising of that to the to, uh, to a wider. Um, process so that's option two and option one was doing it more in house but both options and we'll look at uh, recommendation four as well I oh, know we'll do that separately so we'll do that separately but um, in either option there will still be a um, committee of councillors that will be involved in the process so just so people are aware so I'll open that up for discussion actually and uh, take comments on either option all right who would like to speak councillor Grant Edge thank you councillor Pauling um, I've looked at the two options and um, I'm really quite keen for the sake of transparency that we do advertise to a wider audience and um, that we interview these to provide the independent chair. And then across Canterbury, there is um, a much higher level of, of transparency. So I, I support uh, the. Thank you, Councillor Edge. Uh, Councillor Southworth. Yeah, I support option B also um, in the same vein as Councillor um, Grant Edge. I also feel it's really important to have that transparency that you know, an independent chair should be truly independent and to do that you have to go through a real transparent recruitment process in my view so I strongly support that view. Other people would like to comment. Who else would like to comment? Councillor McKenzie. Um, yes yeah I would support option two which is B um, again because I think um, this needs to be out in the public um, and needs to be fully transparent. Um, so yeah, um, that, that's my view also. So Mackenzie, um, Tumu Taya, Yane Cremor. Uh, Kira Tato, yes, um, agree with uh, what the councillor uh, who spoke for me, um, 3B option two, uh, just to you know, transparency and, and uh, set the nets out wide to to get the best person for the for the independent role. Well Thank you, uh, Yaeon. Anybody else like wishing to speak? Councillor Peter Scott. Yeah, although I'm I'm not one way or the other on this, I'm, I'm I think the skills that you're required to do this are quite specific. Uh, the person you're looking will be quite um, 
a reasonably high level. So just want to know whether the depth of the pool that you'll be looking in is deep enough to get the right person on. That would be my concern. Uh, anybody else want to? Thank you, Councillor Scott. I think that is um, a concern. I think um, I have confidence in staff that they would um, uh, advertise in a way um, yeah, all all types of advertising, you know, out there, all the all that I know, I can't think of all the HR terminology at the moment, but within that, there's a number of ways in which they scope for people to get into that pool. So it's a merit selection, but that getting those people into the pool is really important. So something important you've identified, our councillor Scott. Anybody else wish to make a comment? All right, I think we might put that to the vote then. So that's moved. Um, oh, so somebody. Um, so I oh, know I need somebody to. Um, yeah, you speak. So, yeah, kia ora. Um, thanks for the feedback, councillors. Um, I think that is prudent to um, to advertise widely, and the transparency issues that have been raised is really important. So, um, I'm happy to move three uh, B. Um, option two. I call for a second of the three B. Who would like Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie? Uh, so we're putting option three B um, uh, to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Is there anybody against? There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much, Councillor Pauling. Do you want to keep speaking? Oh, I think we've. Yeah. I'll speak to this, Madam Chair. So, um, I, yeah. So. Item for us, it's read, reads the agree to confirm the subgroup of councillors to work with staff to interview and select an interview chair. I'm going to question around this. Actually, before I move this motion, is do we want to do that now? Yes, my advice is uh, we want to do it now. And um, from some dis very in, uh, uh, open and transparent discussion prior to the meeting, <laughs> which you didn't know about, but anyway, um, <laughs> Councillor Craig Pauling, uh, Councillor Claire. Um, a Mackay, who were both intimately involved in this, if that's the right word, Councillor Nicole Marshall, who's been um, doing great work on the water, um, whatever they're called, and Councillor Grant Edge, who's been just doing great work generally. So, and Yane Cranwell um, uh, would make up that panel. So, if the secretary could. That sounds like it's a pretty open and transparent process that we're going through here. So, as part of the motion, I'm asking do we name those people? Yes, we do. we do. So if you could read that back, please, and then I'll move it. Thank you. Agrees to confirm a subgroup of councillors Mackay, Pauling, Marshall, Edge, and Tumatai Cranwell. To work with staff. To to work with, sorry. To, to work with staff to interview and select an independent chair. I'll, I'll move that. Uh, I'll call for a seconder. Who would like to second that? Seconded by Councillor um, Tane Apanui. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much. And that means staff can get on with their work now and um, get it done. Over to you, Craig. Thank you, Kilda. Tota. Um, so the, the fifth um, recommendation here we have is around the co chair um, provision. And like I said before, um, on the original paper, there was a few options because we weren't clear. Or we hadn't um, completed the engagement with Lurunanga at this stage, um, but we've since had that confirmation. So we've got a recommendation in front of us um, about including um, an Itahu co-chair on the regional committee. So I'm happy to move that and open it up for discussion. Who would like to second that? Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie? Yeah, Any, anybody want to speak to it? All right, Craig, would you like to speak to it? Is um, so, and actually, Vicky, Vicky, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, yeah no, thank you for asking. I was, um, yeah, I just, I'm really pleased. We, we are working hard to be a partnership. It's something the council's been working on for a very long time now. It's got a good history here of working with Naikahu. And, um, and so to have, a uh, co-chair arrangement just seems like the right thing to do and so I'm really pleased that that's been supported by Tron and um, that that's what we're doing. So great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So 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 yeah, we're working working towards the right way of doing things. Got it. Um Kyoda and um 
Kia for the work that's gone into um, into this point point five um, from our seat. Definitely support the opportunity to have a co-chair in place um, in, the, in the initial um, appointment stage, um, and that the clarification, the re-clarification that has been made. Um, so fully support um, the recommendation that is um, before us at this time. Kia ora. Thank you. Who else has what to speak? Councillor Grant Edge. Just quickly, uh, I support this um, recommendation as well, and especially given the um, uh, the letter of shared priorities that this um, committee is going to have to address and the importance of the changes in the NPS for fresh water, um, the Tamana O2I responsibilities in, in dealing with that, um, and, and who better to, to assist with that is the Naitahi representatives and Papatipu um, Runanga. We have the RMA changes coming, the Climate Commission changes, and these are all holistic and integrated approach, and our, having our partnership and partners involved with this is really important. Thank you, Councillor Edge. Councillor Peter Scott. And while I don't disagree with this either, I was just wondering about the timing of this. Uh, Runanga um, have got a lot on their plate in terms of people available to do this. And I asked in question whether uh, the process of the regional committee will be uh, uh, stalled until we get two chairs and co chairs in place, or can it continue with uh, a chair and then add a chair? Well, I sought some advice from the CEO, and I'm sure we can get on with it and have some conversations with Papatapu Runanga around how we're going to do this because we haven't got another process in place. So we'll just initiate that immediately and, and see how we go. So I think I think we've probably got that in hand. Thank you for raising it, Councillor Scott. Back to you, Councillor Pauling. Uh, kia ora, Koto. Um, yeah, thanks again for everyone's feedback on that. I, um, I agree with everyone, uh, all the comments that have been made. And you know, I just think it's important to note that this is something that came up through our engagement process, and that's really important that it wasn't actually in our initial plan, but we listened to the, the feedback that came through an event. That's what I sort of said about the innovative uh, and responsive. We've tried to respond to that and work it through. And yeah, I really wholeheartedly support it. I think, as um, Councillor Edge said, um, it makes sense under the NPS of fresh water, but it makes sense anyway um, to try this and to, to go forward with it. So I'm really really uh, grateful for that and think it's a, uh, a good thing. So I'll, I'll re reconfirm my moving of the motion then. That's seconded by Councillor McKenzie. All those in favour, please say aye. Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Um, all those in favour, you all said aye. There being nobody against, I'll declare that carried. Thank you very much. Craig, maybe you'd like to move six, seven and eight together, if you want. Uh, kia ora, Koto. So these last ones here are a bit more about implementation going forward from this point. Um, it is, is worth noting though that the letter of shared priorities um, is in the paper as an appendix and that's in its current form in terms of um, what the ECAN has put in place with in consultation with the Merrill Forum. Um, but we've also opened up an um, opportunity for Thirunanga and Papatipi Runanga to put their shared priorities into this letter. So this is what six and seven talks about and then of course eight is about what we what uh, Councillor Scott was talking about before in terms of the next steps and the implementation. Um, just so we note, in uh, over the next two months, we're looking at doing the um, code of conduct and shared of shared priorities, getting that embedded down. In May and June, um, looking at the chair co chair appointments and the committee refresh because there's a there's six community members that need to be found for that. Uh, and also in July, it's actually convening that first meeting. So there is a few months up our sleeves um, to run those processes and get those people in place. So yeah, I'll move six, seven and eight. Calling um, for a seconder. A seconder, a councillor Grant Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. Um, there being nobody against. Oh, that's carried. Thank you very much. And thank you for all your work on that. Oh, Phil, have you got a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, well, I will, well, I will, because I think this has been a huge piece of work, and I particularly want to um, congratulate Craig and also Claire on, on leading this work for us. But a big thanks to the staff too, 
But I think we know that when there's a change in a sort of a structure like a committee, that there's a lot involved, there's so much detail. And I, I've really been impressed that in fact staff have with them too, you know, our, I guess, our frustrations at times and getting this right. But I, I, I just think um, altogether that, you know, the chip and, and especially involving um, Naitahu, but um, yeah, it, it's been very demanding, but I think clearly we've got there and we've been well led. So I want to thank everybody involved. That's good, and I'll just add to that just in the last 24 hours, thanks to Catherine and Toshi and Tim and Caroline or whoever else was involved in just making sure we got this straight for today. So that was all worth it because look how swimmingly it's gone. So, yeah, thanks very much to everybody because it did take a while, didn't it? We had to bring it back to council a few times, so that's great. All right, have we moved it? Yeah, we're carrying it, so now my head's going a bit funny. So let's keep going. Um, can't remember what I've done and what I haven't. Page 63, everybody. All right, this has got me on it. This is the long-term plan late submissions. I don't know that we have to talk about this anymore, but for the sake of uh, recording, uh, we are noting that um, we are, um, have a process for dealing with late submissions in the long-term plan, um, that a formal policy on this process for dealing with the late submissions will be prepared for council um, at a subsequent meeting, but noting that um, we're going to have staff use their ex excellent processes to ensure no members of the public miss out who have made submissions that perhaps don't just get lost in the mail or or post. Nobody probably has posted one. I don't know if anyone has, but or something went wrong with the computer and they couldn't get into the into the right place to put their submission in, or they gave it to someone's email and it didn't quite get to the right place in time. So I'll move that from the chair. Would somebody like to second it? Seconded by Councillor Ian McKenzie. All those in favour, please say aye. Everybody's in agreement. Thank you very much. That's carried. And thank you, uh, Louise or whoever, for doing that. It was great. Page um, 65 now, Local Government New Zealand Conference attendance. Uh, this report is to put it on record that the people going to the LGNZ um, conference, and as you heard this morning, that is clearly our union. And I think I might have said that previously, but it was really good to have that endorsed by Dane Cranwell. Um, and there will be Councillor Peter Scott, Councillor Phil Clearwater, Councillor Megan Hands, Tumu Taya, Ian Cranwell, myself, and Councillor Lan Farn will be attending as co chair of the young elected members. Um, there, there is going to be a bit, I'm going to be the authorised person to vote, but when it comes to the AGM vote, there will be the process where our four people who vote uh, go on record. So we'll just have to do a bit of, you know, silly selling around when we get to the conference to get that right, but there's only four votes for the AGM. So we'll get that organised because that's under the constitutional rules. So I'll move that from the chair. Um, who would like to second that? Somebody who's not going to the conference. Oh, Councillor Tane Apanui. Thank you very much, Tane. Oh, does anybody want to raise any questions about that or speak to it? All right, well, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Anybody against? There being nobody against, um, I've declared that carried. Now we're moving to exclusion of the public from this part of the council meeting on your pink papers. Oh, the recommendation. What was that one? 68. Oh, 68. Oh, the recommendation that we move into public excluded. Um, I'll move that from the chair. Grant, Councillor Grant Edge will second that. All those in favour, please say aye. That's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now in public excluded. I'll just ask the people. In and I'll ask Councillor Nicole um, Marshall to introduce this item. Over to you, Nicole, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's exciting to have two chairs in the room today, Bill Thomas from Ashburton and Ken Kiwi from uh, the Hurunui. Uh, it's always fantastic when we get the chance to see what's been happening out in our zones. Um, I'll invite Bill to the table first since we've got him first on the uh, agenda. And um, yeah, you're welcome to talk to your report or go completely off piece if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome Dave as well, Dave Moore from um, our zone team. Yeah, so the button. Yeah. 
I will thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, it's always a bit of a worry when you look at the list and you think, well, I've actually been here for a few years now and uh, maybe it's time to <laughs> move on, but um, we appreciate that. And the, the report has been tabled. There is one, it's a minor alteration, but it is quite significant today, Mike, just on the wording. Mike, just sure. In the, uh, in the chair's column on the front page of the report, the paragraph on the top right, where we talk about the Wakanui stream, um, that should be Wakanui Hapua. So the Sun Committee's not looking at the whole stream at the moment, it's just the Hapua and um, what we can do about biodiversity there. So just a minor correction, which will get changed. So, um, Chair, I'm not sure what you'd like to do, whether we take the uh, reporters read and anyone can ask some questions on, on the way through. We might just talk a bit of the highlights, but also just going forward, how we're going to implement the uh, shared propriety list of the uh, ECAN and ADC and just about what's happening out there in the, I was going to say the real world, but what's happening <laughs> out there in the uh, in the community. Yes, if you just give us a few highlights, um, as you say, and what, what you're planning, and then we can have councillors ask questions. That sounds really good. Thanks very much. If you just pop your um, button on there, thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, I suppose the highlights, you know, it's really um, recreation and conserv uh, conservation groups working together with the whole community. So obviously uh, we're predominantly a farming community, but the town is very important to us. And uh, we try and everything we try and do in the zone committee, we look at how it's going to benefit everyone because there's so much uh, social interaction with uh, the waterways and the fishing and swimming and farming. And so, you know, it can get quite, interesting when you try and bounce all those things i'm sure you all know but that's what we're here to do um the Ashburton river consent process you're probably all well aware of that and, and that's uh interesting uh, and the and the canterbury water management strategy you know there was uh, we wanted to get more water back into the Ashburton river which all the community wanted and so a uh, review of the consents was called in and that's been quite a process for those involved i'd have to say the ecan staff um Andrew Parrish and Henry Winchester might have handled it very well because it's not easy and they're sort of stuck there trying to make decisions and some people are more affected than others but that consent process we're told is going along quite well but it could be interesting at the end. Um, there were a few people who feel they're really disfranchised from it and uh, uh, that'll come in so that's probably been our most controversial one at the moment. Um, interesting one is the managed act for reef charge program which we call Ma. I know a number of you have visited it. Um, it is probably essential in our district because to get these low nitrates the only way that we'll be able to achieve that is with a bit of help from nature and this is just the way of that happening. Um, probably get off the side a bit but I just noticed in the, in the in the in your rates document you're talking about a targeted rate for this and Personally, and a few people probably feel that a lot of the community will benefit from this. And there's areas in Timmel, which is sort of a, a, a part of the Ashburton town, they've got very high nitrates. And the only way, and it's a farm, it's a, a it's a, a rural area and an urban area they mix in. And the only way they can lower their water and everything is with something like MAR to, to filter that out. So whether it should be more of a general rate on that, I'm not too sure. But that was just uh, to think about it because if you spread it over a lot, a lot of people it wouldn't be very much money but if you hit a few it's quite significant and it was a project that was supported by um, environment can be right at the word go and the zone committee sort of always stuck up for it too so if, the, if there was a change in thinking from the council we'd sort of want to know about that because that would have you know quite a bit of um, an influence on um, on what we're doing um, on a on a Committee, uh, no, we will support it. I thank you for Dave Moore. You know, he comes from ECAN and takes the minutes and keeps us going. And we plan the agenda. And we're, we're very lucky with the um, staff that come and address the meeting, which I must say, ECAN's come a long way where everyone used to think um, everyone was against them. But uh, now, when you get to know the staff personally and they talk through farmers, and we're not getting the issues that we used to get, which is, um, which is a testimony to the staff. Um, the one issue I do have is probably uh, relating to the Runangas and local iwi. You know, they're, they're really important to the process and they always their default position is, well, we're a signatory of the treaty and you can't do this without us going through. And I have no problem with that. But I do have a problem when they don't turn up to the meetings. 
and then come along afterwards and then try and change something being described at the meetings because and I know their resources are short, but I mean, if we could find a way to try and get them more involved and um, it would just be easier because we need to understand what they really are feeling about it so we don't go off on a tangent that they don't agree with. Um, and there have been some excellent people, but a lot of them are, have retired now or moved on to higher positions and that we don't seem to be replaced. And there's quite a list, I think, of the iwi that are involved, different ones in our, in our whole zone. So. Uh, be nice if we could do something about that. Um, and finally, I hope I'm not droning on too much, but finally, um, I think it's really important with ECAN, you know, to get really involved in the, in the regional thing because uh, central government have a plan which is, um, you know, lowering these nitrates and levels of water management, which is quite different from your original Canterbury water management strategy, which was a challenging document anyway, and I think was well thought through at the time. And a lot of those ideas still need support from the, from ECAM because they were good ideas and they're functional. And I just took a liberty, and you might, Dave, you might just circulate a few of these around. But basically, it shows the um, the different drains and and the catchment, that we, the zone we're in, and it's quite unique. I don't know what there is. There's probably 20 or so drains that are flowing from the from the main road or just above to the sea in this whole area. And there'd be nowhere in New Zealand where that happens. And so, and he can understand these drains very well, right from the old days in the catchment board. So it's important that you people, um, you know, support us when talking to local government, because we have your buy-in to help us do these essential uh, freshwater management changes. It'll be accepted, I feel, by the government, and then he can can help us run the process. So. Um, that's probably it. I don't know, Dave, if you've got anything else that you'd like to. I probably missed a bit, but if you've got um, something you'd like to bring up. Unless you want to just talk about what's in the action plan. Oh, yeah. Well, but, yeah. the action plan is really thorough and it's it derived from the, um, the priorities that, that um, both ECAN and ODC have. And basically, it's Ashburn Lakes, uh, and we're lucky to have your CEO for a drive up there recently and saw firsthand what's happening up there, which isn't great for anyone's standards, but we're going to try and do something about that. Carter's Creek and Enhancement, which is the water which flows through Ashburton into the Lake Hood area and Ashburton River, um, and the Wakanui Hapu project, which is basically planting out the bottom there. And um, with our biodiversity program, I think, in Ashburton, we're trying to create a corridor from the hills to the sea with plantings. And that's where Ma comes in too, because the water's there, we can plant those and they're to trade. So hopefully we have a corridor for the for the native birds to fly from Peel Forest down to the um, Ashburton uh, Lake area at the end, and Wakanui and, and the plantings that people will see. So all those projects are taking along quite well, and biodiversity, which is important too. So um, that's what's ahead of us. And I think just one, one other thing to add is there's quite a lot of motivation in the Heinz area at the moment to uh, create a vision for biodiversity there, and there's talk of setting up catchment groups in that area too. So um, that's quite exciting and the, the zone committee will be involved in that process. Basically, just if there's any questions or. Thank you very much, uh, William. That's great. I think Peter Scott's got a question for you. Um, yeah, just a question, just to follow up on the Runago. Uh, but I know that Carl has um, um, finally handed in his um, um, and in his credentials, and I, I don't know if you've done anything about acknowledging Carl, uh, but I know that he's, his health isn't well, <clears throat> and I know that he we expect him to do a lot of coverage in terms of the whakapapa of the area for Arapanoa, and I just wonder where you're at with that and whether we should actually combine with him and do something just to thank Carl. Uh, yes, well, we did acknowledge him locally. We had a presentation for him, and um, he's been a very valued member of our community, and. Um, we're just sort of challenging him with finding a successor, but uh, but he was acknowledged on behalf of ECAN and ADC, and we our presentation was given to him, and I think we handled it pretty well. Any other questions or comments about um, this report? Well, it doesn't seem so, but I just want to make a couple of reflections. It's really timely to have you today because we had Ma yesterday, an excellent report from staff on Ma. 
And um, I think you're right in terms of um, creating more biodiversity in the area. You're getting a you're getting a double whammy out of the ma. So I thought that that's great. What's what's happening with that? So that's really good. And um, we'll certainly be trying to hook in um, alongside the staff that already are around the catchment groups and the biodiversity. Uh, work that they're doing because catchment groups are springing up everywhere and you know it's fantastic to get the community involved at, at, at that another level. Um, we're also, um, I can't wait to get you, my hand on that map that you're passing around because it's much better, although it's good as well, Ian's squiggly drawings on the whiteboard and so I've been wanting to get one of these maps but I haven't asked him so I'll just have to get your one so that's fantastic so thank you very much for bringing that. Um, and those drains are, of course, um, going to be um, a very interesting conversation uh, indeed in the new freshwater policy statement and where we go in that area. And it's exciting to find out what, what, we, what we're going to do. Um, so, you know, um, thank you very much for your involvement in chairing the Zone Committee. We really appreciate uh, that you're doing that work. And um, it's very valuable work for everyone, I think. So uh, we, I also took on board the issue around uh, resourcing iwi. So, so that's a, a very important point to raise. Did anybody else want to say anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and coming today. Thank you for your report. Thank you very much, Bill and Dave, for coming along. Um, it's been great to hear back from you. Um, and yeah, we know the drains are challenging, but they're also great fun. So it's great to see what's happening down there. Thanks. Yeah, I just was going to make, I just remembered that um, in the refresh of the Zone Committee, in terms of reference, that we've tried to deal with the Runanga, um thing by having proxies, which would hopefully make it better. So, yeah, just so you know, there has been a bit of work that's done, and it'll all depend on getting the people, of course, but at least that's been looked at. So, there's a tough thing to be understand. Thank you. Um, and now, Ken and Murray, I'll give you guys both to the table. Uh, thanks for coming coming into town today, Ken. It's great to see you back in the building. Uh, over to you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, great to be here. I do want to say a big thanks um, for the opportunity. Um, I might just reflect Murray, and a bit unfair on Murray, because um, he's got a, a job or two to do, and um, he's probably sort of my mind of the day. So if you see him give me a kick, um, you'll know what's going on. So it, it all should be good. So. I'm just going to reflect a little, if you don't mind, um, and if you do, he can, he can kick me, but I'm going to reflect on a year of frustration um, and the fact that I feel like a bit of a con at the moment in being the chair of the Hudanui Waio Ufa Zone Committee, because we're not really a zone committee anymore. We're not really doing anything, and I'm finding it extraordinarily frustrating and difficult, one, to be sitting here and two, not to be doing anything, because it's not in my genes um, not to be doing anything. So, <laughs> sorry, Jenny. Um, and so I'm finding it very frustrating and very difficult. Having said that, I know a lot of good work is going around, along around other zone committees. And, and it's just great to hear what Ash Burton's up to and what others are doing, and to have attended last week, Murray, um, in terms of the work that other zone committees are doing. But I want to make it clear, we have to sort Urunui Waio Ufa out much sooner rather than much later, because actually in the absence of that committee, whatever it's called, opportunities are being missed and risks are emerging that if not addressed, are actually going to be an embarrassment to the two councils and I think an indictment on where the Canterbury Water Management Strategy is not going in that space. Now I'm going to be giving the same message to Hurunui District Council in a few weeks when I go to their meeting. Um, but I think you deserve to hear it because it's actually really important and really frustrating. Now, having said that and got that off my half Irish chest, um, I'm a bit happy with that. So I do have some other comments that I'd like to make, which I think are better scripted, but I think fill out some of that story. So I've already said a huge thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, today. I do want to thank our zone committee members who have stuck around, write difficult emails to Claire, I'm sorry Claire isn't here, uh, difficult emails to Claire and difficult emails to Mari Black um, about what's going on with the Zone Committee. But I think a combination of their trials, their errors, their frustrations and external drivers have all led to the situation that that Zone Committee is now in. And clearly I've played a part in that as well, but it's a frustrating 
part. But I do want to thank Claire. Claire's been fantastic, um, Chair. She's been really amazing and continues to be today. And I work closely with Claire on what that potential future might look like uh, for the Zone Committee or whatever it turns out to be. And equally with Mari, I work well with her and with the CE of Hiranui District Council. I think we're actually trying quite hard to shape something that might work going forward. But I emphasise the might because I don't know when the going forward will go, get into gear. And as I've already signalled, uh, the longer it waits, the more we're likely to miss. So I do thank um, the Zone Committee, even though it's, it's roughly in abeyance now, I thank them for their efforts and I, I thank our previous facilitator as well. Third, and irrespective um, of what happens next, and I emphasise uh, the next, I'm actually not convinced that the relationships between our Zone Committee and both councils were as good as they could have been particularly in the operational areas. So I think in terms of the zone facilitator, we've been, we were really lucky, had two really good um, zone committee facilitators. And I've been a bit lucky recently that Murray's been able to step in and protect me. Um, so, so that's good as well. But I'm not sure that from a strict operational sense, we were as aligned, as aligned as we could have been and need to be in the future. And I think that's a bit of a challenge going forward. Um, maybe just for our zone committee, because I can't speak on behalf of others, but I think it's something we just want to test the water and the land on. So I would describe that, and I revisited my words this morning, I would describe it as a work that was in progress. As you know, we don't really have a zone committee anymore. I do want to address something, though, that I think is really good uh, that has occurred, and it's right there in bold black and white in our annual report, and that's Plan Change 1. Um, and that's really the legitimation of dry land farming from the point of view that they don't need a resource consent to farm. It might seem absolutely obvious that that would be the case. Uh, people like Ian would know that and others, um, but it wasn't so obvious for a long time um, in Huranui, Waio, Ufa Zone. But we've worked really hard as a zone committee, particularly with ECAN and the staff, both in a policy, regulatory and science frame, that's three rather than both, uh, in all of those frames, I think have worked really well with us um, and the council has worked well to get that plan changed through. So that became operative on 1 September last year, something that I, previous chairs of the zone committee and the existing committee, I believe are all really proud of and we should feel good about. And there are other good things uh, that we should feel good about that the zone committee's been doing, not just in previous years, but also last year as well. So. I listened to what Ash Burton talked about in terms of the biodiversity space really carefully, and I think we too have done some great work in that space. And if I think about the North Canterbury coastline, for example, where we have supported through immediate steps a large number of small valleys, having work done for those valleys, whether they be through fencing, combined covenanting with, covenanting with QE2 Trust or others, we now have a significant network of biodiversity joined up together in something that I think is a model of its kind, not just for North Canterbury, but for many other places as well. I went a wee bit unscripted, and my fifth point I've already talked about, so I won't go over it again, which was around um, opportunities and risks. Um, but I, I think just to give you an example of one opportunity, and I was saying to Murray, this is one that I'm taking a part in at 12.30 this afternoon, and it's working with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with a Murray Irrigation Company. So I'm going to be meeting with their CE and another staff member to talk about working with others and some opportunities wearing one of my other hats where I might work with Te Papa Artify, because I do work part-time part for Te Papa Artify or the Department of Conservation, around a big initiative that that company would like to do with us on the Waio and Waio Ufa and Hidanui Rivers. If I was able to wear my zone committee hat, and other members of the zone committees were on board. Actually, that opportunity of working with others would be absolutely huge. But at the moment, it's probably that big along a continuum that should be that big. And that's one of the opportunities that we are potentially missing out on. And they're saying, Ken, we want to work with you because you wear some other hats as well and you can demonstrate this joined up approach to making things work. So I think my final message, G don't go on too long. Um, my final message would be, and Jenny and I, sorry, Chair, uh, the Chair and I were talking about this over morning tea, um, is that if we are to make all of the changes that Wellington is bringing forward work, 
then to me it is about working together. So in DOC, we describe that as working with others. We talk about Papa Tua Nuku Thrives. We talk about partnerships, relationships, doing things better, um, letting go, and actually working with each other. And I believe within the frames that are being delivered, and um, not just by Te Papa Arafai, but by Ministry for the Environment, MPI and others, we are truly going to have to do that. And I think zones and others have a big role uh, to play in seeing those opportunities through. So Chair, I'm going to leave it at that. I'd welcome any questions and thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. Thank you for your directness on this. I mean, uh, we are in an interesting situation with our hybrid going on, where it's going on, but I really, and you did explain about, I guess, about opportunities, but you're unique in the fact that you can see those opportunities. Uh, so my question was going to be why, you know, why will the opportunities get missed and why won't they get picked up by our hybrid up there? So I think they, it's a great question. I, I think they will get picked up if the hybrid model is supported in the same style of way that the existing zone committees are. So I have a fear. Um, I, I think it's um, been relaxed a bit over the last week uh, that the hybrid, which may be a model that is, and I'll, I'll call it supported in quotation marks, but maybe housed by HDC might not be properly resourced in terms of, for example, a facilitator. I, I just cannot see how a committee of that sort or this sort can work properly and deliver on the opportunities without professional staff support and the support of both organisations on the ground, both in a policy and operational sense. So if that happens, Peter, yes, it will work. Um, but without it, I don't think it will. Just picking up on your comments about lost opportunities um, and the way the situation is in Hurunui at the moment or in other parts of Canterbury, where um, we have different entities, agencies, providing money to independent projects, doing all sorts of things that maybe we don't really know what they're doing. Um, do, you, do you think that the way forward will actually be this uh, cooperation, coordination between uh, government agencies, the regional council and local authorities, zone committee fitting in there somewhere. But is, is that a really significant lost opportunity in the, the money and the process and the uh, costs and benefits uh, are not being well coordinated? Is that? Yes, so thanks, Brian. Again, another another great question. Um, wearing my, one of my other hats, um, I try to lecture about that sort of thing and try to teach young students around the potentiality of, of joining up. And, and now that I work for government with my other hat, and I have before, I know how hard it is to get that done. Um, for, for whatever reason, we stay in our own towers because it's safest to work in those places and we don't like to let our guards down, lest someone chop our head off. And, and so I still extol the virtues of what you're talking about Grant, but it's a difficult thing to do. I think the Public Service, sorry, the Public Sector Act uh, of 2020 provides a huge opportunity to try and get this right. And certainly around Wellington now, what I hear every week that I am up there, and I'm certainly getting it from our Director General, is that um, with MPI, uh, DOC, MFE, and LINS more or less being housed as one sort of unit, not as one department, um, but as one sort of unit thinking across these sorts of um, issues, then I, I think that there is promise there. But I've seen that sort of promise before, to be honest, Grant, and I've hardly ever seen it delivered. So it takes ministers who will drive that. And I know with the government before last, uh, no, the previous, um, yeah, yeah, the government before last, that's right, uh, under the national government um, of Prime Minister English at the time, that when I met with him, he would say, I have tried to drive the same thing and I have struggled to get ministers across that line. So it will depend on whether we can get our current government, get those ministers across the line to do that delivery and to fulfil that promise. And then it will require the governments to work with regional councils and others. And I know how hard it is. That's OK, there's no media there. Um, I know how hard it is when I'm over the road in the dock office 
um, in town here, how hard it is to get some of those people to work outside of the building and working with others. And actually, I'm sure the same challenge sits here as well, as it does with lots of other agencies. So Grant, long answer. Um, it should be possible to do this. What I'm really saying, it's really hard, but if we're committed to do it, then we should do it. And I do believe that zone committees have a role. Oh, that's okay. Ken, <laughs> um, uh, thanks so much uh, for your frank words. It's, um, it's really good, actually. I was, I was hoping we were going to get some of that, so it's good. Um, so I helped work um, with a group of councillors here with um, Perinary District Council on the hybrid um, model. <laughs> and I suppose, like your words there, I heard at the end about letting go. I suppose that's what we've actually tried to do a little bit with that is, um, you know, for years, I suppose, under the CWMS, um, Regional Council has led the way with the community and, you know, our TLAs have sort of tentatively come in at times um, to play that more supportive role in terms of putting staff resources towards it. That's what I really mean. So not about the other support. They've definitely been supportive. Um, and so that's, I mean, I was at the start, I was thinking, what is the solution that Ken's um, going to say here, but I've sort of heard about it in some of your answers about ensuring that professional support comes from her new district council. And I think that those councillors of us that were on that, we felt that too, that that's a must. But we want to actually encourage that from her new. So we're going to see how that um, plays out because we we know we've got our facilitators ready to go. If not, but we want to see what they're going to bring. Um, and then I've, you know, I've obviously picked up the message there about tightening up the operational alignment. And that may be potentially that could involve um, crown agencies as well, which would be fantastic. Um, and we'll try to do that in other places, like in the Waitaki, for example. Um, so yeah, sort of answered my question. But um, yeah, is that what am I on the right track with what you're saying about the hybrid model? With um, can it, is it going to work? So yeah, just yeah, if you could describe here exactly. I would have thought I was loud enough without it, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, so uh, kia ora, Craig. I think the mahi that you're describing is exactly um, what we should be seeking to achieve. And if we can assure that with this hybrid model, then I would be um, reasonably confident um, that we would make progress. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh, so there is a, I think just by way of one parting example, I think, if I think about our two major um, awa in the zone being the Hurunui and the Waio Ufa, I just see enormous potential for the government agencies to join up for, for Linz and Dock um, to get together. That's why under Minister Sage we had the same minister, and that was actually a really good thing. Um, but then operationally, how do we make sure that the two CEs are online and so are the staff further down uh, the line? And if we could do that for those rivers, we would start to get on top of weeds um, and other nasties from top to bottom, and we would really get some gains because we would really be working with the farming community and others. So that's what I'm looking forward to achieving, and I see the district council playing a big role there. Look, I think Craig has answered my question. My question to you, Ken, was what are your concerns about the resourcing? But it's centred more around the Hurunui District Council rather than ECAN. So I just want a clarification about that. So that's cool. Kia ora, thank you very much for your free and frank uh, advice to us and comments around that, Ken. It's massively appreciated. Um, I just wanted to comment on that operational alignment thing. Um, the Zone Committee Refresh Terms and Conditions does actually have that addressed in the action plan. So it is something that we've we've noted and we have taken action on. So hopefully that will throw come through into the hybrid process. I can't see why it wouldn't. Um, thank you so much for coming in today. Good luck with your meeting with Amuru Irrigation. Um, and thank you to Murray for stepping up and stepping in, in with Hirunui with the lively bunch of characters we have up there. <laughs> um, we'll go back to the recommendations now. Um, and the, Moving these recommendations, I want to note the staff that have been mentioned in the two uh, presentations by both Bill and Ken. Uh, first by Bill, he acknowledged both Andrew Parrish and Henry Winchester in the efforts they've put in around the consent reviews. Also praised there to Dave as the facilitator for keeping the uh, zone committee on track and focused. And secondly, uh, Ken there acknowledged both Murray and his predecessors in the uh, facilitator role in the Hurunui and also a shout out to fellow fellow councillor Claire Mackay for all the part she's played in, in shaping our path forward. So thank you 
very much for your presentations this morning. Um, so I'd like to move those recommendations as read. Um, if anyone would like to second me. Ian. I'll take over again. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to adjourn. Um, so what we 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 have got Fran Wild coming from the your enumeration authority, and we're going to be talking to her. So we can turn off all the machines, and we'll adjourn for one o'clock. Thank you very much. Page 69, number 10, other business, there being none, we can move on to 11. There's no notices of motion. There's no questions on notice. Councillor Scott. Um, apology, apologise, and you can uh, probably pull me back in my bottle if I'm not, you're not allowed to do this, but I, I'm, unfortunately I wasn't in the room when you talked about the par minutes, and I had a question. Oh, well, I'm going to... No. Did you say no? <laughs> I'll ask about something. That's fine. We'll move on. Thank you. My question is about cash. Well, it's 52 million there. You know, I'm just asking, I want to ask Grant. Uh, the A plus four was talked about having it being done. When is that going to be done? When will we have an idea of how much? My understanding was that, that that information might be available at the end of April. So, over to the CEO, Councillor Scott, that is coming to all of you next week. Miles will be back and we will be covering the eight plus four um, and just noting that in terms of cash we've had advance payment from central government on a number of the grants and so we will be able to articulate the difference of what is actually still being held and could be utilized in future for instance for the LTP or otherwise. As you, as, as you will be well aware I mean that has a, a material influence in terms of our decisions around the LTP and any cash that we can get will be great. Thank you. So staff have that in the process, so that's really good. We're looking forward to that next week. Um, there's no, the next meeting. 29th of April. Yes. Uh, we could close now. I'm going to invite um, Councillor Ian. Do you want to close? If you'd like to. Carl Walker, area, take Carrero, take. Career, Road, sorry. Kite Tahu, Oto, Tatu, Wari, Kia, Tikina, Ano, Atunawa, Atunawahi, Haumie, Huye, Tahu. Hi, Kia.